<clears throat> Hello, Gary. Hey, yep, it's me. How you doing? Good. Can you hear me okay? I can. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. That's okay, good. Yeah, so we, we're good to go. We were having uh yeah, we're having some some problems getting everything uh where we haven't done we haven't used this uh this connection uh this from the setup on the board for I think over a year, so uh, Ooh, okay. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, to uh, to talk with me today. Um, if you you had a, was there a time concern for you that you, you had? Say so you broke up a little bit. Say again. Oh, was there was there a time concern? I just got your other email about uh, you know. How no, I just wanted to know about how long it was going to take because I was trying to plan the rest of my day. Okay. Yeah, we can we can definitely uh, you know keep it keep it quick. I have a couple of things that. Uh, I definitely wanted to talk about after having read the book. Sure. Um, yeah, not a problem. And also, the cool thing is that I, I feel like it's be you know you sh- I feel like you should have been on the uh, if not in the commentary on on the the DVD at least had you in the uh, supplemental material or some kind of interview. But uh, mm-hmm. I feel like uh, as as big a fan of the movie as you are, you should get some kind of uh, representation. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, I, I get the the adoration of my fans, and yeah. that's uh, that's really enough for me. Um, I uh, I don't think uh, I don't think you'd want to see me on the on the DVD. I I break your uh, I break your TV, so uh, <laughs> it's not a problem. We uh, I was telling my other the other two guys that we're doing the commentary with um, when I told them that I was going to get Gary Wolf, the author of the book. They both said the same thing, which was, "Oh, really? Is he? Are you sure that's a good idea? Does he like the movie? Is he? Is, does he approve of what the movie did to the book?" And I said to them, "I said, you guys, you guys, he might be a bigger fan of the movie than both of us put together." He might, and you know, at least I, I'm I'm gratified that they didn't say who. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you you're represented. Um, yeah. Actually, in, I'll I'll jump straight to that uh, in terms of the way you are sure. represented. Um, being a diehard fan of the movie and also the shorts and, and anything Roger Rabbit, I noticed when uh, Roller Coaster Rabbit came out, which was the mm-hmm. the second short, um, mm-hmm. you received screen credit as a creator, but mm-hmm. uh, there was no screen credit for Tummy Trouble or even. Um, uh, trail mix up. So what? I what? think there was. I think there was for trail mix up, but uh, uh, <laughs> tummy trouble. They just flat out forgot it. Oh really? It, it, it's yeah. It's contractually obligated uh, that I get screen credit as based on characters created by Gary King Wolf. That's that's in my contract. It's not negotiable. But whoever did the credits for tummy trouble just flat out forgot it, and. Um, so of course, you know, I went to see uh, what was that horrible movie it was with, where they were killing the elephants. Um, I can't remember, but it was a horrible movie, and I I went to see it just to see the cartoon, uh, which I had seen them working on it, but I'd never seen it all together, all put together. So I went to the theater to see the cartoon, and um, oh, Operation you know, Dumbo Drop, huh? Operation Dumbo Drop. Uh, is that what it no, was? I don't think so. Was no, it was, it, was, uh, it was the one. It was the one about uh, Africa and two kids in Africa, and oh. they, they, they started off by killing a bunch of elephants. It was horrible. Um, but uh, so I, I saw the cartoon, and I, you know, I'm waiting for my credit, and boom, there's no credit. And uh, oh my god! So I sat through the movie, and then I, I sat through it again to watch the cartoon, and again, there's no credit. So, um, uh, I mean, that's that's a violation of contract, right? And and it's and it's important to me creatively too. So, you know, first call was, was to my attorney, and his first call was to Michael Eisner, who immediately immediately sent me a telegram. We we didn't have email and stuff. He immediately sent me a telegram apologizing for this. He said it was it's an oversight. Whoever did the the credits just did not know that yeah. my credit was re- was required, uh, so that was on a I don't know Monday on Tuesday. This this Brinks truck pulled up out front of my house with this big bag of money, <laughs> and they said, you know, I hope this makes you feel better. And 
That'll do it. So I called Michael and I said, well, yeah, it does. So when Roller Coaster came out, uh, of course, I went to see it. And I really kind of had mixed feelings. Did I want my credit there? Or did I want another big bag of money? I don't know. <laughs> but... If, if, but, uh, if I can if I can posit a theory just in terms of what I know about what they were going for with those cartoons is that if you're trying to parody the old 40 style they didn't they really downplayed credits at the beginning and they didn't have them like uh, in roller coaster rabbit the credit wasn't a title card it was actually a, a Chiron it was right over top of mm -hmm. you know and they, that stylistically mm -hmm. they didn't really do that in, in the Tex Avery cartoons and stuff so maybe yeah. in the tummy trouble thing maybe somebody was just like well we can only have one or two cards and you know they yeah, no, I, th I think I think you're overthinking it. Yeah, uh, maybe. They, they parodied, uh, they didn't even parody it. I mean, they, they went for funny, humorous cartoons, and uh, they weren't looking to reproduce a Tex Avery cartoon or a Warner Brothers cartoon. Yeah. They were just trying to do funny cartoons. So that's that whole title thing, where the title credits were, and, uh, don't overthink it. That's just the way it turned out. I do want to talk about the uh, how Disney uh, found out about uh, the book because they 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 got the rights to the book pretty quickly from what conventional uh, research has shown me. Uh, mm -hmm. Quick question: Is it mm -hmm. possible? Again, this might be me overthinking, but is it possible? that Disney knew about or got wind of the book because Roger in the book summons the genie by singing part of When You Wish Upon a Star? Well, you know, that's a really interesting theory, one I've never heard before, but um, I'm going to do some research. I'll ask the genie tonight when I see him and find out if that is indeed true. It might. It may have been the thing that alerted them to, to, to your whereabouts. Well, well, I got to tell you, uh, you know, the genie allowed me one wish, and uh, my wish certainly came true, uh, <laughs> and still is, still is coming true, so me, it could well be. Let me just uh, go strictly into the book here now, and, and now that I got mm -hmm. you on the phone. Um, one question I had about the genie, I, I didn't, and I, and I didn't read, maybe I didn't read this, you know, I kind of read this quickly so that I could get, you know, everything fresh for the, the interview. How mm -hmm. exa how exactly did Eddie know that the tea kettle was actually a genie before the genie came out? I missed that part. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, uh, everybody thinks that authors uh, <laughs> are familiar with every with everything in their book. Yeah. Uh, I this have is not fresh on read my mind. that. Yeah, I have not read that book for probably five or six years. And in, in the interim, I mean, I've written, since I wrote that book, I've written two other Roger Rabbit yeah. novels. I, I have no idea. It, you know, I, I remember uh, uh, oh, one of the uh, one of the Dashiell Hammett uh, novels that was adapted for the screen uh, with Humphrey Bogart and Lauren McCall, I believe. And um, th there was some question about why somebody was killed, you know, and who killed who killed him and why he was killed. And so they, said, they couldn't figure it out from the book, so they called Dashiell Hammett, who had written the book, and he didn't know either. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to plead ignorance on that one, which is really easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've never had to plead ignorance. I live it every day. Um, I will say this, something else that was always interesting to me is the... Uh, the dichotomy of, of the title of the book versus the title of the movie, because mm -hmm. the title's use of Roger's name in the book is more of a summation of a situation involving an ensemble of characters, all of which mm -hmm. are affected by the, the one character, the titular character, although Roger himself is not in the book for very long. And even though the title of the movie is only one word different from the book. The use of Roger's name in the movie title completely suggests that this is his story from beginning to end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. It's a, it's a, so it's, there's so much I could go on and on about how. Yeah. Co the, cool the, that is. The, you know, I wrote the book to be the best possible book that I was capable of writing. And it, it may well be, I mean, I haven't written my last book yet, but it may well be. Um, uh, the the first book is really Eddie 
any story. It's not Roger's story. Yeah. Although Roger is in it all the way through in a um, slightly different form. Um, yeah, the doppelganger. The, the, yeah, you know, the uh, the movie, of course, a Disney movie, uh, they're not going to, and I'm not giving anything, any secrets away here. I think most people who are my fans know that the rabbit dies in the book. Yeah. Uh, Disney is not going to make a movie about a dead rabbit. <laughs> I mean, you know, Disney wants maybe, to maybe sell. Maybe an invisible one. You do Harvey, but yeah, yeah, that. Disney wants Disney Disney wants to sell stuffed rabbits, and yep. um, with someone who has a financial stake in uh, <laughs> how many of those rabbits they sell, I want them to sell the rabbits too. Um, they they change the story. Uh, I I have no problem with it. the The book is a book story, and the movie is a movie story. Mm-hmm. Um, what I what I am overjoyed about is that they they kept the the basic premise of cartoons, comic strip animals, uh, characters living in a real world. They kept the the, the characters, the the basic characters, Roger Rabbit, Jessica Rabbit, Baby Herman, Eddie Valiant. They could have changed it to Roger Raccoon. Um, But they didn't, and they kept all my characters. They kept my premise. They changed the title from censored to framed because they were afraid of using censored in a title for fear that uh, parents might think it was a dirty movie. Right. And uh, I actually like Framed a little better than Censored. Uh, but, but again, the title Framed came after I sat in a meeting with like 35 of the most creative people I've ever met in my life. And... Um, you know, afterwards, I thought, you know, where were you guys when I was <laughs> writing this thing on my kitchen table at four in the morning? You know, I would have won a Pulitzer Prize, and the book would have been named Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So, um, I, and to, you know, to get back to your original, original, original question, I, I am overjoyed with the way the movie came out. I think the movie is the absolute best possible uh, presentation of my book, which I really did not think was filmable. When Disney came to me and said, hey, we want to make a movie of this, uh, I was happy to happy to take the money and you know happy to to consult with them and happy to play along with it. But I really did not think this was a filmable book, and they they definitely proved me wrong. I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful movie. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful book, and people who have read the book and who have seen the movie. Um, well, I don't know. Some of them say the book is more interesting because it forces you to use your imagination. Some of them like the movie because it puts it all right on screen. They're both good. I think what we're, what really happens the most when you read your book your books after having seen the movie, or maybe even vice versa, is that you kind of get to see, it's kind of like going to a film set or a location where a film was shot and you get to, you sit there yourself and you go, oh, I see what they, what they saw in this area that they made into the thing. You read the book and you're like, oh, I get this. But with that in mind, I want to say that I'd like to be the official person to set right a few things because as far as the uh, internet is concerned, there's only two things that you get credit for in the movie. Um, that would be the lines, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. And uh, the 30-year-old lust and a three-year-old dinky. Um, yeah, which is my favorite, yeah. It's a great line. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. by my estimation, Gary, there are about six things that are in the movie that you are either directly responsible for or indirectly responsible for. And I would like to have your comments on them, if I may. Um, Let's hear them. Yeah. The, the, the first one, I guess, would be starting at the end. The genie melts much like how Doom does um, mm-hmm. over, the, uh, over the aquarium. Uh, yeah. a, l- a little more about the Doom thing. The evil human character or characters masquerading rather obviously as humans when they are, in fact, tunes. This would be the DeGreasy brothers, again, versus mm-hmm. Doom. You know, it's 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 not exactly a big reveal that that Doom is a tune, and that's kind of why I thought it was as a kid. It was so funny that you know it's tune humor. So, oh my God, he's a tune. The joke is, of course, he's a tune. You know, it's like, yeah. And yeah. with a name like DeGreasy Brothers, you got to know something's up. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. something you 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 planted the seed, and you deserve more credit for than you get. Um, they say that uh, you didn't create Benny the Cab. 
but I would argue that Benny is a reworking of the Junkyard Beetle. Mm-hmm. Would you yeah. agree? I would agree. Yeah, I, I would agree. Sure. And I would also agree with the uh, with the, the melting genie and the melting uh, melting doom. But you got to realize that melting characters. Uh, yeah. I mean, we all owe a lot to. Um, um, Wizard of Oz. Uh, you know, the, the, the way Wizard of Oz, yeah, which yeah. is melting. Uh, yeah, Benny the Cab and the Beatles, sure. Uh, yeah, but you got to remember that, that they spent, Disney spent from 1980 to 1985 until Steve Spielberg came on board uh, trying to convert that book almost verbatim mm-hmm. into a movie. Yeah. And so a lot of those concepts, they reworked. Uh, to make it a family-friendly, family-friendly yeah. movie, so it, it is it's entirely possible. Sure, those are those are kind of more um, superficial ones. There's there's three more. Mm-hmm. There's uh, uh, when when tunes and humans fuck. It's called patty cake. That's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. They don't they don't ever credit you with that. I don't know if you necessarily want to be credited with that, but. Um, it is. It is from the book. It's in the book. Wait a minute. So, so we're back to we're back to the author is ignorant. Was that in the book? <laughs> yeah, it's a patty cake is in the book. It's it's when he. Oh, well, okay. Then. In in the book, whenever whenever a tune and a human yeah. has intercourse, it's called patty cake. <laughs> That's in your book. I gotta, re- I gotta revise my. Uh, I gotta revise my. Uh, well, another uh, thing my, that. My, Maybe you should call your lawyer on this too, because uh, Baby Herman's design, the way he's described in the book, is verbatim the way Richard Williams drew him, right down, mm-hmm. right down to the color of the blonde hair with the bow tie and the blue eyes and the the mm-hmm. one or two teeth and the cigar. You, I mean, you basically yeah. you designed him for Richard Williams, is is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And probably the biggest one that you deserve credit for is that. A lot of times people, you know, that grew up with it that are my age and, and a little bit younger, we kind of see this civil rights and segregation oh, satire in the movie. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's yeah. definitely there in the book. Um, yeah. Of, of all the things you've talked about, I've, uh, they all went right over my head. But that one, for sure. That was in the original. Yep. Uh, that was uh, something that Bob Zemeckis really caught and we discussed that um and that is something that was in the movie too uh you know the the tunes are second class citizens yeah. um and the, the, you know they're just they're discriminated against uh yeah it's in the book and it's in the movie sure. there's uh for the for the audience that maybe hasn't read the book uh tunes built the helped build the railroad uh, there's slander towards them, and also there's posted mm-hmm. signs that say we don't serve tunes here. Uh, mm-hmm. Jessica suppresses her speech balloons, much like how some African American jazz musicians would straighten their hair to appear more white. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And and in the movie, of course, they don't do that kind of stuff, but you do see little hints of it. There's a line when the beetle, when the, the beetles, when the weasels are coming in, and Rogers, you know, pleading Eddie to help, and he goes, you know, there's no justice for tunes anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's like when yeah. you think about it, yeah, there's, there, there's, there's little hints of it all throughout the movie. So, I mean, I think that's, if anything, something that, if anything you deserve credit for that is in the movie, that's in the book, it's that stuff. It's the civil rights stuff. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and you, you have uh, you've read that book probably closer than anybody, including my mother. Well, um, it's, no, it's, I, not, it's not even that. It's that I've read it recently. No, okay. it's um, and I'll tell you that, and I want to ask you this, and I apologize in advance because this question is slightly long-winded, but I want to—I do have a question. There is a question here, and it's about having read the books, because I want to mm-hmm. talk a little bit about Eddie Valiant's narration in the books versus the lack of it in the film. Um, my dad is British, and he knew of Bob Hoskins before the movie came out, and mm-hmm. so. I remember when we first watched in the theater, he would tell me about, about Hoskins. And that started a conversation about Eddie being a private eye. I'm sorry, my voice is getting, I'm starting to go here. Uh, my, about being a private eye detective. And um, I remember my dad said that he thought that the film had kind of lost an opportunity to do the genre right by having Hoskins doing pun heavy narration. And that's, of course, my dad being British. That's how he pronounced narration. Narration. 
<laughs> so then about <laughs> about 10 years later would be 1999 i got a copy of uh who plugged roger rabbit and uh i thoroughly enjoyed it but i was i was really happy to see that because i hadn't read the first book that eddie was the narrator and it was done in that film noir style and I hadn't read the original book yet, but I did something that I sometimes do when I was reading the when I was reading Plugged, that I mm-hmm. I do when I, I really enjoy a book. I devour it until the last two chapters, and then I stop and go back and reread it again because I don't want it to end. <laughs> so so <laughs> I, I, I am I am tickled to death. That so my I book was a book you did not finish. Anything. Yeah, so I read Plugged a few times, and then recently and then recently read Censored. And I have to say that your prose, as it were, I'm sorry to say that I haven't read any of your other novels, just the Roger ones, and I look forward to reading Whacked and the fourth one. But uh, the quality of your writing style, particularly from the point of Eddie's narration, it got notably better from the first book to the second book. So my eventual question is this. Uh, if you adopt my assumption that your prose got better from the first book to the second book. How much of that would you attribute to the influence of the film versus just the natural progression of an artist getting better at his or her craft? Well, it, it, I'll tell you what happened between the first book and the second book. I had never had an intention of writing a second book because the rabbit was dead. And, uh, uh, but then when, when the film was such a success and people were pestering me, Hey, what about, uh, what about a sequel? What about a sequel? I finally gave in and said, all right, I'm going to write a sequel. And my problem was that, um, it, oh, my God, it, billions of people have seen the movie. Uh, it, it's grossed $1 billion. So figure half a billion people have seen it if they paid a half a buck a piece. But uh, maybe 300 people have read the book, and that includes uh, my mother and all my aunts. <laughs> so uh, to, you know, to the general public, Roger Rabbit and the Toontown uh, characters are all the Disney movie characters. Now, I didn't want to do a Disney book. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to remain true to my original concept, which was uh, word balloons, uh, slightly edgier characters, a more mature story. So I came up with what I thought was a kind of an interesting hybrid. And yeah. I think it worked. I think it worked pretty well. I, I, I think it worked pretty well. I did have to find a way to resurrect Roger. Uh, and if you if you read Plugged, yep. you might have caught that. Yeah, uh, how he, I uh, how, was uh, it was Jess- Jessica was it was a dream, right? Jessica dreamt it was a book. dream, and and I wrote that book shortly after uh, Bobby Ewing came back in Dallas and turned out that the whole previous season was Pam Ewing's dream, and I thought, well, <laughs> oh, you know. Works, works for national television work for me. <laughs> so um, I did that. And I think a lot of it was the fact that I that, that the movie was such a success that I felt a little freer to really experiment with prose and, and the, uh, the, the similes and uh, just Eddie's speech patterns and the story. I, uh, it, it was a very racy story if you read it. But, was, uh, but I think I think a lot of it also was just my natural progression as a writer. I think I'm better. Yeah. I was better then than I was when I wrote the first one. Yeah. What about if? Uh, what about the fact that uh, the censored takes place in the '80s, whereas the other books take place in the late '40s? I am the I am the Lord High Potentate of Toontown, and I can set these books in any damn era I want. <laughs> uh, the first one took place in a kind of a never never land. It wasn't actually the forties, and uh, so I, I kind of play fast and loose with the rules of reality. Right. I, I bring in. I mean, there is a there is a very small character that comes in at the end of of plugged. Um, I won't give I won't give it away, but that character virtually disappears uh, in whacked. So I kind of play fast and loose with the characters I use, with the times, with everything. Whacked. Uh, my feeling is that censored is really a, a, a classic. It's a, it's a really good novel. Mm-hmm. It may well be the best thing I've ever written or will ever write. Uh, Plugged is pretty good. Whacked, I think, is almost up there with. Uh, was censored. It, it's it's really really good. Uh, it's a great story. I came up with a lot of interesting new kind of tunisms and 
and Eddie's narration is really pretty good. Uh, so I would go with uh, censored, whacked, and plugged in that order. So if you haven't read Whack yet, you're going to treat in store. I certainly will. I'm going to uh, let you go, but I got one last question, and it's it's more of a, a simple kind of question um, because the you know the influence of both the book and the movie is uh, cartoons and newspaper comics. So what were your favorite? Uh, give me your favorite newspaper comic and your favorite uh, cartoon. Oh. Uh, um, well, favorite cartoon, uh, I would have to say my favorite cartoon is probably um, maybe Bugs Bunny yeah. uh, doing um, doing the one at the opera. What's Opera Doc? What's Opera Doc? Love that. It's a classic. Yeah, uh, I'm also I'm also a great fan of anything Donald Duck. Donald <laughs> Duck is Donald Duck is my absolute favorite all time. Uh, cartoon character, and I, I always resented the fact that I could never understand what the hell he said. My uh, my favorite comic strips were Prince Valiant, uh, Terry and the Pirates. Uh, favorite comic book was Black Hawk. Probably you've never even heard of Black Hawk. I have. Uh, yeah. S- Steve Spielberg owns the rights to that, oh, and really? I'm hoping that someday we will see a Black Hawk movie. Although. So- it's pretty racist, so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is Eddie Valiant? I would assume Eddie Valiant is named for Prince Valiant. Uh, he, he, nah, not not quite. I I never really put that together. Although it, it's a good story, and I'm going to steal it from you and use it from now on. <laughs> but uh, Eddie was actually named after my father, who's na- who was Eddie Wolf, and my favorite uncle, who was named Eddie, um, and. Uh, uh, Jessica, um, well, Jessica was an interesting was an interesting character because uh, I had uh, when I was writing the book in San Francisco, I um, uh, as as a charity thing, I was pretty well known as a science fiction writer in San Francisco when I was writing Roger Rabbit, and as a charity deal, I said uh, to KQED, who was the local television uh, television. A station doing, doing NPR kind of stuff. They were having a charity auction. I said, "Look, you know, it, it, to the high bidder, I will, um, I will make uh, the high bidder a character in my book." Hmm. And so, uh, some young woman did like five hundred dollars. So I, you know, I said, "I'll, I'll have, I'll have lunch with this person. You know, and find out something about them. I'll write them as a character in my book." Because I had a ton of characters anyway, so I, I, I met with this met with this young woman, and uh, she was a she was a woman who was like, completely devoid of personality. She kind of sucked the personality out of those around her, and had no humor either. So I went back and I told my wife, "I, I can't do this. I cannot portray this woman the way she actually is." I said, "Well, you know, who I got here that I can just." You know, name after her, and I, you know, of course, I had Jessica, mm-hmm. who was like the prototypical bombshell woman. So I named Jessica Jessica after this woman. Oh, and, you know what? That's uh, that's another thing that I didn't add to my list of things that you don't get credit for. The joke of the fact that she's not a rabbit, but her name is Rabbit because she's married to him. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So you know, the book came out, and I sent a copy of it to. The, the real Jessica and I, and after I did, I thought, "Oh my God, you know, she's gonna, she's gonna be really, really ticked. She's gonna want her five hundred dollars back." So she called me and said, "If I read the book and I saw my character and you captured me exactly." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, let me uh, let me let, ask you one last question that popped in my head. I I've saw. No, go ahead. You can ask me as many as you want. I'm loving this. Great, you great. Are, this is. Uh, I'll give you. A, I'll give you a good stroke here. But this is like the best interview I've ever had. I, 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 you know, I am. I am amazed if I'm in an interview and someone asks me one question that I've never been asked before. But you, you're on a roll. You got. Dude, like I've, I think I've been. Here. I've been conducting the, uh, the 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 questions for this interview. I'm going to be 40 this year, so I was like nine or ten when Roger Rabbit came out, and yeah. I was I was already a cart you know a cartoonist, and that's why I do the videos. I do the Looney Tunes critic videos and stuff. So this is mm-hmm. like you know this is a long time coming. Um, but I'll I'll ask you this this one last question because otherwise I'm just going to be 
you know, just asking geek questions like, what was Bob Hoskins like? What was Steven Spielberg like? And it's like, all right, we get it. <laughs> but, um, well, Steven, Steven Spielberg uh, was kind of like Mickey Mouse. They both, uh, they both have big ears and wear yellow shoes. <laughs> yeah. He, I, I like Steven. I like him, his stuff, but he is a goofy looking bastard. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you said it. I didn't. I, said, I didn't say I'll, it. I'll be happy to say it. If you've ever, if you've ever seen uh, any episodes of Animaniacs, they uh, they they treat him fairly in the world of caricature. Let's just put mm-hmm. it that way. He looks. They they continued the great Warner Brothers tradition of you know caricaturing you know people and putting it into the cartoons. Um, yep. I saw a couple of pictures on your your Facebook page um, of uh, of you on I think on uh, at Eddie's uh, Eddie's desk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have any uh, Do you have any stories? Any on set stories that you haven't shared before? Uh, of, of me on Eddie's desk, or just be, um, or just being around on set uh, for the movie if you were uh, around. Uh, sure. Um, a couple. First of all, the. Uh, uh, there was a, a restaurant list, and uh, they had put it together. I think when they were making George Lucas put it together when he was making Star Wars in uh, in London, and it was the 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 restaurant list that that, that the uh, crew had put together that was really the great restaurants of London, and. Uh, you know, talk about an oxymoron. Great, yeah, great restaurants. It, it, I mean, we're we're, <laughs> we're we're English, and I can say it too. You know, England is known for a lot of things, but, uh, but I, I think yeah, uh, I think John Cleese said it best on the Daily Show when Craig uh, asked him. He said, uh, "Why does British food suck?" And he said, "Well, we had an empire to run, didn't we?" <laughs> <laughs> well. My, my wife and I, when we were there making the movie, we got this list, and we started running down the sister restaurants, and I'm thinking, one of them was a freaking McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but uh, when I was sitting there at that desk, uh, that, that bottle of booze in front of me was an actual bottle of booze, and oh, Hoskins really? was on the other side of that, and uh, when, we started, when we started shooting the pictures, that bottle was almost filled. <laughs> and by the time we finished, the bottle was almost empty. Oh my. Uh, Bob was Bob was just one of the greatest guys I've ever met in my life. He was uh, he was such a talented, talented, talented actor, but uh, not a movie star. He he had no ego. He was just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And uh, I I, uh, I resisted using Bob Hoskins as Eddie Valiant because, for God's sake, he's British, you know. He, this is the prototypical American private eye. How's a British guy going to do it? But when he, when he started his, his audition, he was the only one that really made us believe the rabbit was real. Yeah. And now, now that he's gone, I, uh, he will forever after be my Eddie Valiant. Uh, I... Uh, I, I will always write Eddie Valiant and think of Bob Hoskins. Yeah. I'm not crying. Shut up. Um, <laughs> yeah, I am. I, am. T- I totally am. I really am. I, uh, I, the, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you my, my only regret about the movie. I only have one. And uh, my only regret is that Bob Hoskins did such a phenomenal job of acting in that movie that he made it look so easy yeah. that he didn't even get nominated for an Academy Award mm. for what I still believe was the greatest single job of acting ever done by any any actor on film. It's one uh, of the, and that is it's such a it's a thankless performance because it's one of those things where if he does it perfectly, you don't even notice it. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And, and there were times it. there were times when he was in a room with nothing just him and his imagination making it all up in his head when uh when he was handcuffed to the rabbit if you watch that scene closely you'll see that handcuff is actually a spring yeah and so he was not only moving his hand he was moving his hand in such a way as to move the rabbit's arm uh and if if he screwed that up, then the whole thing had to be done over again yep. because it wouldn't make sense. But phenomenal guy. One of my favorite pieces where you can see that that ability to act with no, you know, just dead space 
is is that there's a there's a shot when he he Roger's been dancing on the bar and he's like you got to keep a low profile and he goes back into the speakeasy he throws Roger you know Roger jumps onto this box which incidentally I only noticed this years later but when Roger's getting preachy about laughter the box is a soapbox he's literally on a soapbox <laughs> yeah, yeah but anyway um, so he, he's standing so he's standing there and he's and he's in and Hoskins is pacing and Rogers is Rogers in the center of the shot. And it's so brilliant. He, he walks away from the rabbit and then what looks back and he finds the space. He finds the eye line. It's brilliant. I don't know how you do that. How do you do that? Uh, you, you just a genius. And, uh, you know, I miss him terribly. Yeah. Life, life you know what's up. really weird is my favorite scene in the whole movie doesn't have any animation in it. It's completely his scene. It's when he comes home and he's got the, you know, he's got he's looking at the picture of his brother and he gets drunk mm-hmm. and that's the one long shot yeah. and that that's my favorite yeah. scene in the whole movie. Yeah, that's Bob Hoskins. Yeah. You know, he he was he was brilliant when it came to interacting with tunes. He was brilliant when he was on on the screen all by himself mm-hmm. um just a great great guy yeah. well i'm i'm definitely gonna read the uh read the new book and read whacked um and uh we'll be we'll do some more stuff because uh you're a great guy and any excuse to get you on the phone and chat is going to be uh one that i'm going to take if i can get it well i i will i will reiterate one more time this is like the best interview i've ever had you were you were just a brilliant brilliant interview thank you sir and i've been interviewed by some of the best people on local cable tv stations well i i <laughs> I, I take that i i take that with uh with uh <laughs> with a grain of salt no no yeah, the grain it's, of salt the compliment. size of the moon get out of here you say that's all the guys no <laughs> well so it was a pleasure to officially meet you sir and uh I I, uh, I interviewed uh, Jacques uh, Muller, and uh, he, oh, he he said you were uh, he said you were uh, an ace guy, and he's absolutely right. He's right. Wonderful guy. He did the uh, uh, he did the scene where Roger and Jessica are hanging from the uh, from the rope. Yep. And uh, that is the animation cell that Disney gave me autographed. Oh, really? Uh, it's, it, yeah, it's autographed by Kathleen Turner, by Bob Zemeckis, uh, Dick Williams. Uh, Bob Hoskins autographed it, and Charlie Fleischer autographed it, and Steve Spielberg autographed it, and um, that was what brought me together with Jock. But the really weird, freaky thing, uh, I, I have it hanging on my wall, and uh, the day that Bob Hoskins died, I looked at it, and honest to God, his autograph had disappeared. Are it you- was gone. You, you cannot even see it. It was gone. And Shut I, the I, fuck up. I, I looked at it, and I said, this, this can't be. And I, I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and it was. It, it is gone. I looked at earlier pictures I had taken of it. It's there, bigger than life. You know, the day he died, it vanished. Wow. So, you know, I'm hoping the rest of them hold on before I saw it on eBay. So, <laughs> so I <said> that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I, I don't think we can uh, we can top that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gary, My for pleasure. taking out the time. And yeah, uh, I'll uh, I'll get in touch with you uh, when everything's put together, and you can you can see it and promote it and whatever. That'll be great. Thanks a bunch. Have see a ya. great weekend. Bye. Okay.